Case. Good evening. This is Making the Case. I'm Yuri Tewalde. The trial of three men accused of killing Ahmad Arbery has the nation's attention tonight. Divisive and what most would call racist statements made by one of the defense attorneys sparked outrage on social media. Now those comments have prompted black pastors from across the country to make plans to head to Georgia. BNC's Dre Clark has the latest from Brunswick tonight. When defense attorney Kevin Goff made those incendiary comments in the courtroom on Thursday, it upset not only people who were sitting in the courtroom, but also here in the community and all across the country. Before the jury was brought in, defense attorney Kevin Goff addressed the court. And my apologies to anyone who might have inadvertently been offended. Goff's entire mea culpa lasted close to 30 seconds. It was far less than the three minutes he spent in court Thursday claiming Reverend Al Sharpton's recent appearance in the courtroom with the Arbery family intimidated jurors. But it's what he said next that made eyes roll and mouths drop. Obviously, there's only so many pastors they can have. And if that, their pastor's Al Sharpton right now, that's fine. But then that's it. We don't want any more black pastors coming in here. Almost immediately, Goff's words went viral, trending quickly on social media. Ben Crump saying in the tweet, it's not illegal for black pastors to support the parents of Ahmad Arbery. Going on to say, we are going to bring 100 black pastors to pray with the family next week. The other defense attorneys who sit next to Goff in court also found his words offensive. It's a ridiculous comment. And when we try approaching Goff, do you think you, what sir. you said yesterday was, was racist in any way? What I say in court, I say in court. He was deflective and reluctant to speak with us. But no one was more offended than Wanda Cooper Jones, Ahmad Arbery's mother. What Goff said yesterday was very insensitive. Um, I, I don't see how anyone could see Al Sharpton's presence as being something that was negative. The first full week of testimony concluded with prosecutors calling more law enforcement to testify. Prosecutors say Gregory and Travis McMichael, along with William Bryan, murdered Ahmad Arbery because they thought he was a black criminal. The three men have pleaded not guilty, claiming Arbery's killing was self-defense. Next week, we're expecting black pastors from all across the country to make the trip here to Brunswick, Georgia, to sit and to pray with Ahmad Arbery's family and also to send a message to defense attorney Kevin Goff that they are here and there's absolutely nothing he can do about it. Court resumes on Monday morning. In Brunswick, Georgia, I'm Dre Clark for Making the Case. Later in the show, I talk to a religious leader about the impact of those statements and how the faith community is rallying to support the Arbery family. But here to give this week's headlines a legal spin are my panel of experts, veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor, Paul Henderson, and criminal defense attorney, Latoya Francis-Williams. All right, guys, let's get started. Uh, the comments <laughs> made by William Bryan's attorney, Kevin Goff, yesterday, um, and the backlash he's getting today, let's watch a clip of that right now. There's only so many pastors they can have. And if that, their pastor's Al Sharpton right now, that's fine. But then that's it. We don't want any more black pastors coming in here or other Jesse Jackson, whoever was in, was in here earlier this week, sitting with the victim's family. If my statements yesterday were overly broad, I will follow up with a more specific motion on Monday, uh, putting that and those concerns in the proper context. And my apologies to anyone who might have inadvertently been offended. Paul, uh, this case is difficult enough for the defense. I got you, Paul. Uh, <laughs> but William Bryant specifically has had to deal with his lawyer's reckless mouth. I mean, even the lawyer representing one of the McMichaels called Goff's comments asinine and wanted to make clear that neither he or his client agreed with what he said. Uh, what is your reaction to his statements? Well, thank you. First of all, why <laughs> would raise that issue about how many casters they can have. And I'll come back to the they in a moment. But secondly, how dare you raise that issue in the context of race? Are you kidding me? To raise that issue mm -hmm. in this case and in this trial is so offensive. And I hope it was offensive to everyone in the jury as well, everyone in that courtroom 
so that they see that this tra this case translates into an offensive race case once again. It was so offensive, but the question that I raised that I wanted to know is, who is the they? Are you talking about black people? How dare you speak for the community that you know nothing about? And how dare you present it in court as an adoptive admission as if you are the authority that gets to speak for white people about what's allowed in a courtroom that's not your courtroom in a case that's about race that you, sir, are on the wrong side of. Sit down. I'm offended. I'm irritated. I'm frustrated. It goes without saying there's no legal analysis here because it doesn't rise to the level of legal analysis because it's pure ignorance, it's pure bigotry, and it's pure racism. And that's all it is. So I'll just leave it at that. Latoya, he said black pastors. Your thoughts? He said black pastors. And, you know, sometimes we like to think you don't want to dignify ignorance with a response, but this certainly deserves a response. Um, it is clear that um, this attorney spoke from his heart. Um, he said what he meant and he meant what he said. Uh, but the message that we should take is this. We cannot forget that Ms. Jones is a survivor of homicide. Her child was murdered at the hands of three white men. That's the bottom line. Uh, what is clear, however, is that the underlying reason for the murder was race and race related, and that counsel for the defendants, and I say plural, because even if they are outraged today, no one said anything at the time in question. Many times when we are in court, the right time and the right time to say something, either object or to join in a motion, is immediately. Not to let any time pass, but it has to be contemporaneous. So the reality is, this attorney said what he meant and me, he meant what he said. They don't want black people in that courtroom. They know the power in numbers. They know the power in the Negro spiritual. They know the power in a support from the community. And they'd like to pretend that keeping us away from the courtroom is somehow going to give their clients some leverage. That's not going to happen. Well, Dre uh, mentioned that in his response to this, or in the response to the, his comments, we could see more black pastors from across Georgia in Brunswick next week and across the country. Um, let's listen to what Ahmad's mother, Ms. Wanda Cooper-Jones, had to say about it. What Goff said yesterday was very insensitive. Um, I, I don't see how anyone could to see Al Sharpton's presence as being something that was negative. He know that my family and I are going through some very, very trying times. And anyone who can come and sit with us to give us any sort of any, any sort of inspiration and encouragement, I mean, it can't be frowned upon. It's all good. And we've been told that it's possible maybe some more pastors will come in the future. What do you have to say about that? They will be embraced because at this time um, we've made it, I've made it this far because of prayer and from the God that I know. And if they, if they want to come and help us out and pray with us, I mean, they're more than welcome. Paul, um, you know about the prayer and the vigil from a few days ago um, where Reverend Al Sharpton appeared along with several of the family's attorneys. Now, I didn't question the prayers and the support shown for the Arbery family, but I did question the presence of the media and the attorneys discussing the evidence and, and making the case to the public. You can pray and support the family without the presence of the media. Why discuss the merits of the case to the public knowing they aren't the ones who will be deciding guilt or innocence if you didn't want to influence a jury? Well, I think it's really important, especially in a case like this, that people, especially disenfranchised communities and communities of color, do have conversations in association with sometimes these prayers and the prayer vigils where people are called in groups to action, and that makes the conversation more palatable. We can't fix what we don't talk about, and we can't talk about what we don't know. So I think issues like the ones that are raised in the Ahmad Aubrey case in particular shine the light on transgressions with our criminal justice system beyond just the issue of things like vigilantism. So we have to talk about the reaction of police to crime scenes, the interaction of law enforcement with victims, the interaction of law enforcement with people of color, how people are charged with crime, how people are sentenced in crime, all of those race disparities that have to be unpacked 
it makes us all better advocates if we understand those systems. And so I'm not offended by those conversations. And I don't connect those conversations to an intervention or jury notification. There's separate issues, and I support that pastors want to be a part of supporting the community and the family by being there and participating in these gatherings that ultimately, at the end of the day, uplift communities of color and other disenfranchised communities about our criminal justice system. All right, I want to, I want to get your guys, um, I want you to grade both sides, that is, as we close the first week of testimony. What is each side doing right? What are they doing wrong? LaToya, you on the defense. You know, as far as the defense goes, this is a pretty high hill to, 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 to hoe. Um, at the end of the day, the best the defense can do is raise the defense that they've raised thus far, which is self-defense. Unfortunately, unfortunately, if their argument is that we had probable cause to make a citizen's arrest of Mr. Arbery, yet they cannot articulate any crime being committed, it makes it very difficult. At this point, honestly, they can only talk about mitigation. So in terms of how is the defense doing, I believe from the conduct of counsel throwing that Hail Mary about black pastors to um, trying to cross-examine at least our last uh, witness that's still on the scene, uh, Special Investigator Sechrist, the best they can do is raise the possible defense of self-defense, but I don't think it's going to get them very far. In terms of the state, I think the state is really doing a phenomenal job in trying to compartmentalize the elements of the offenses as they are charged. Uh, as we heard today, uh, Inspector uh, Sechrist advised that he interviewed Brian, and Brian was very clear, the reason we stopped Aubrey is because it was instant. That falls far below the threshold, woefully short of this concept of probable cause. That's a mere hunch, if anything, at best. Yeah, well, the defense can't uh, mitigate with comments uh, like Goff's. But, uh, Paul, <laughs> more on the prosecution. How are they doing? Um, I think they're doing a, a decent job. Some of my concerns are some of the issues that we've been talking about, bet about how they have to dance around introducing the evidence and the testimony without shifting the focus of accountability from onto law enforcement away from the defendant, their bad behavior. And we know there are so many things and the litany of them are falling out as we're getting the testimony and the evidence about the things that law enforcement did not do or the things that they did inappropriately by not offering to try and help Ahmaud Aubrey as he bled to death and just died in the street. As they bestowed privileges upon all of the defendants at every step of the way, all of those things, I think, can be distractions to the jury, and so it's a, a harder time for the prosecution to lay those things out and stay focused on the actual case so that people are considering and evaluating the bad behavior of the defendants. From the defense's side, I think some of the things that are really inappropriate and will come back to bite them, or at least I hope that it does, are casting aspersions and trying to paint Ahmaud Aubrey as a bad person, as qualifying his movements as suspicious and threatening and engaging and talking about him having the audacity to exist. I hope that that comes back to bite them and I'm offended by it every time I see it from the defense presentation about their questioning and about how they've raised and introduced evidence in their cases. 